First of all, I'd like to thank your side for giving me this opportunity and this privilege to come before you today and share some information, some insights with you that I've read about, that I've experienced. And hopefully, after this, we'll all have some information that can serve us on this path. I also would like to enlist the support and encouragement of my sister and brother, Sarah, as well as our pre-missions. Now, because I'm uh, <laughs> new on this path, going to have to rely heavily on my nose. And I hope you'll bear with me as I go through them. Because as I pick this topic, um, my topic, by the way, is meditation. It's a big topic. And I didn't really realize how big it was until I started actually thinking about it and reading about it. It really is the path. Meditation is the path. There is no path without meditation. And as we will find out, some of us have already found out, without meditation, there is no progress. So, idea for this topic came to me. I was carrying around a little pamphlet called Science of the Soul. I've been carrying this pamphlet around for over a year. And I actually read parts of what I'm going to bring to you today. But I'd never read the whole thing. So one day I picked it up and I happened to see this particular piece in the pamphlet. And I was excited. I said, wow, this is great. So, of course, I ran it off and, and brought it to Guru Sahib to see if it would be okay to share it with the rest of you. He said, yes, it would. And not only did he say that, he, <laughs> he gave me a task. We all know that when we go to him with something, usually it turns out that we have to do something with it. So it's going to be in a little pamphlet that will be distributed as soon as it's finished. And, and this, this is the cover that Bilal so graciously did and let me pick out yesterday. We did several and I picked out now. So much of the information that was in the pamphlet you will be getting. Today I want to highlight some of that for you and then give you some more points and suggestions that I have. The name of the topic was Why Meditation? 13 Good Reasons. And I'm going to bring it to you rather in a capsulized form. Because as I said, each of you will be getting one of the panels. The first thing in meditation is effort. Effort, as we all know, we can call it another name, hard work. If we do not do this hard work, if we do not have this effort, we will make absolutely no progress on the path. Our effort is to get us to the eye center. That is where everything begins. Even the perfect masters that we've read about in the past went through the same things that we, we're going through. They expended this great effort in order to do their meditation. 
As a matter of fact, for the great master, that's our master's master's master. After he was initiated and while he was still working before he became great master of the Dara, about a seven year period went by while he was working. Babaji would write him. He wrote him over a hundred letters. And in each and every letter, he always told him to remember his simmering and his budget and to do those faithfully every day without fail. So if Great Master had to do that, then I'm sure it's not too much to ask for us to do. And we all know that effort brings about success. If you're an athlete, if you're a musician, if you're anything of note or you have accomplished anything, you have had to put in an inordinate amount of effort to do that. So effort is very important. Obedience. Obedience to the instructions of the master. Whatever it is he tells us to do, we must do that faithfully, with love and devotion. We should resign ourselves to whatever the will of the Lord is, because he always knows what's best. Routine. Routine, routine, routine. Some of us look at that and say routine, boredom, routine, blah, routine. But we must get into a habit of doing our meditation. Routine is the only way we establish that habit. Everything that we have learned, everything that we do on a daily basis, we have formed as a habit. We must do the same thing with our meditation. Until we do this, there will be no progress. We will struggle. We will fight it. We will have had all kinds of agonizing moments about our meditation. But we must establish a routine, a regular routine for our meditation. We must also establish a routine so that this meditation, this routine, becomes a way of life for us in our everyday lives, in everything that we do. Whether we feel good about meditation, bad about meditation, we don't want to meditate, it doesn't matter. We must do this daily. Daily. Not some days, not when we feel like it, but all the time. As we go through this effort, obeying the master and this routine, we will find, after some time, of course, that it's a pleasure. This is really one of the few times in our day when we're not bothered by outside activity, by outside thoughts if we're lucky, and we can fix our attention at the eye center. So it becomes a pleasurable time for us. It becomes something that we look forward to doing. And this pleasure is permanent. It is not temporary, like so many of the pleasures that we chase after every day, that our strategies send us hither, thither, and down to get. Those are perishable pleasures. They don't last long. And they are not very, really pleasurable. But the pleasure that we derive from meditation is permanent. It does last. And it will serve us. Refuge. Once we find that this activity is a pleasurable one, we also find that there's another benefit. Whenever there's anything that we need to do, whenever there's anything that we want, 
there's always this place to go for. You can go to the master in our meditation. He is there. Whether we want something or whether we're going to pay homage, he is there. He is always there for us. The master says, look upon the eye center as your place of refuge and fortress, and always take refuge in it for safety. Prayer. Now we think of prayer, those of us who were Christians and, and, and we went to church and we prayed, and when we prayed, we were always asking for something. Well, when we pray, we ask for things. When we meditate, we receive it. So actually, meditation is the complete prayer. When we meditate, we actually abdicate ourselves to the will of God. We say, whatever it is, God, we will accept it. We surrender to your will. But some of us continue to pray and ask for things. And it's all right. The Master hears us. But whatever we pray for, we cannot expect our destiny to change. We can't pray away what we would consider bad things that might happen to us. All we can do is ask for grace to be showered upon us so we may accept anything and everything that comes our way. Karma. Our karma is fixed. That's our destiny. We cannot change that karma. But what we can do with our meditation is to burn up the stored up karma, the sin shit karma that has been building up over these many hundreds of thousands of years. But we can only do that in our meditation. If we have meditated in progress to the point where we can actually hear the sound current, the shadow, that is what burns up the karma. Some of us believe that when we're initiated, that our karma is passed on to the master. No chance. <laughs> it is not passed on to the master. This is work that we must do. We must get to the point where we can actually burn this karma in the shop as we listen to it. The master says that 99.9% .9 of this karma is burned during meditation. So that in itself should be a real good reason to meditate and meditate all the time more effectively. Understand that once we go through seven good reasons for meditation, we get to the point where we begin to see things in a different way. Our awareness has risen to the point where we begin to understand that if we meditate, if we do the things and follow the instructions of the Master, that we will get to the point where we will see this world for what it is, the reality, and not the conceptual and conditional reality that we live in every day. But that understanding only comes from meditation. It's what Mir Dodd calls the holy understanding. And that understanding and awareness is not something that we can buy out of the store or something that just comes to us. It takes all those things that I have mentioned. And once we begin to understand, we become grateful. We become grateful to the Master for his blessings, for all the things that he has done for us, for the way that he has brought us. Because we're all in bad shape but we're in just a little better shape than we were before. Actually, we came here in great shape because we came here in the human form, the precious human body. So that's a blessing in itself. We must learn to see those blessings 
to understand that we did not bring ourselves where we are. We of ourselves can do nothing. It is all done by the Master. And for that, we should be eternally grateful. Dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction really is a form of meditation. Because we're not satisfied, because we're struggling, because we know we can do better, we keep on trying. If we got to the point where we say, oh well, I got this made, I got this down, I can do this, we would stop trying. The effort would no longer be there. So this dissatisfaction with our progress, with our meditation, with the way we are, keeps us moving on the path. It's the impetus that carries us along. Humility. For most of us, it's extremely difficult. Hmm. Simply because we think we're who we have built up in our egoic minds that we are. You know, I'm all this and I'm all that. And, and people tell us from time to time, hey, you know, you, you really are something. And, and we start believing that. So, you know, it, it's, it's hard to be humble when you think you're uh, uh, something else. So what we have to do is to remember humility, humility. And false humility, humility, which is what most of us will encounter first, is hard to determine because we think we're being humble in circumstances, situations where we really are not. But the test, the test to really let us know whether or not we are really practicing humility is whether we are doing this for ourselves or whether we're doing it for the Master. And if you're doing it for the master, that's you. For yourself, then it is false. It's you. It's just another form of pride. Love. Most of us feel that we know about love, and we've experienced love, and that we love somebody, and somebody loves us. We don't know what love is. Master knows what love is. <clears throat> he is the only, the only one who can show us this experience of love, of love. He can demonstrate for us what true love, real love is. He does it on a daily basis. All we have to do is watch him. Just watch. See what he does. See how he handles situations. He does things and things. We say, dang, how did he do that? Or, or why? That's, that was stupid. But he handles everything the same way, with love and understanding. And that's how we want to be. That's what we want to get to. That's what we want to understand. That's what we want to have. That's what we want to be able to do. Love. The last and thirteenth good reason is grace. We are all here by grace. Whatever we do is because of the grace of God. Because He loves us. God, as we know Him, is our Master. Because God in His real form we would not recognize. So what he does is he sends his messengers. He has sent them throughout antiquity. And we are indeed fortunate to have been blessed to come in the company of one of these messengers. Make no mistake about it. Our master is a messenger. So those 13 things, effort, I memorized them at one time. So 
to me that it was like a step ladder that you couldn't jump from effort to humility or you couldn't jump from routine to dissatisfaction that each one of these followed the next one that you had to have all of these effort obedience refuge prayer humility before you got to love you had to have all of these before you got to grace you had to have the one before you got to the other one. it's like one thing led to another. And that, that was my interpretation as I read these. And as I said, when you get when you get your copy, those people who are not here, this is the cover. And and each of you will be receiving a copy of this the little pamphlet. When it's ready. Master called me this morning by the way, Dr. Marge, and said, Is the book ready? <laughs> I said, uh, they didn't get it to me yet. So I, he put it on me and I put it back on somebody else. <laughs> but, but we're working on it and, and you're going to be pleased with it uh, when you get it. Okay, thir 13 good reasons why we meditate. Okay, so then what is this meditation? You know, what is it that we do? We bandy this word about, and to one person it means one thing, to another person it means something else. But here at the House of Rock, it means at the time of meditation, at the time of initiation, I'm stuck on the word, at the time of initiation, we are given the process of meditation, which involves basically three aspects, Simran, Dion, and Bhaji. Simran is the five holy names of the Lord that we are given. Dion is the process whereby we contemplate the form of the master. And Bhaji is the sound curve, the shabbat, nam, Logos, Word, Song of the Spirits. It's been given many names, but it is the sound curve. And at the House of Ra, we practice Sur, Shab, Yoga, Yoga, moment to moment. Now the moment to moment is new. It is something that our Master introduced. What that means is that for 24 hours, every day, we should be practicing one of these forms of meditation, either the Simran, or the Dhyan, or the Shabbat, 24 hours a day. Now we sleep part of that time, right? Does matter. You want to get to the point where even while you're asleep, you are conscious. You are awake 24 hours instead of sleep 24 hours as most of us mm -hmm. are. What I did next was to, to try in my own experiences difficulty, struggle, and misunderstanding, and, and you know, messing up, which is mainly what I do. 
I tried to come up with some little tidbits, some little sayings, and, and things that, that might help or work for us if we could think about them. And now what I want to refer you to. Actually, it's, it's two versions of a book. Okay. Now, this, these were the first two volumes that were put out. Uh, book one, Life, Death, and the Quest for God Realization, and Life, Death, and the Spiritual Path, which was book two. Now, in these two books is a section on meditation. And I don't think anywhere in, in historically or currently will you ever find a more definitive, a definitive, clear, concise um, description and explanation of meditation. This is the newer book. Now, if you don't have either one of these, I'm going up higher. Sorry, it's my. If you don't have this, I would urge you to see Dhamma Maji, Siddharthi, Balao to get them. Because it will, once you read those sections, that section on meditation, it'll clear up, it, 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 clears, it clears all of it up. It clears all of it up. Because bottom line is, we're all going to die. We, there's no doubt about it. It's happened, been happening throughout time, and it's going to keep on happening, and it's going to happen to us. And, you know, it's, you can die like a warrior, or you can die like a cow. I want to die like a warrior. And to do that, I know i got to get this meditation back. And in order to do that, as, as Guru said to me, you got to step it up. Pump it up, Guru. That's what he said. So that's what I'm trying to do. So I, I'm really pleased that I was able to, because I learned a lot of stuff while I was putting this together, you guys. I really did. And I said, wow, I didn't know that. Gee. But death. Like the TV on commercial, Mr. Goodrich, you pay me now, I'll pay me later. <clears throat> now, paying me later is going to be much higher than paying me now. We want to die while living, right? Yes. Meditation is the art of learning how to go through the bardos. And that is dying while living. A voluntary death, if you will. One where we can do in our meditation. We can simulate actual death and then come back. And we can do this to the point where it becomes second nature to us. So when the actual event does occur, we're prepared. We can simply rest in the knowledge and the wisdom that this is just one of those things that we've experienced. It's like a death because actually something is dying. We're killing the ego, just crushing it because it is the bottom and the basis of all our suffering, the ego. But guess what? When you kill the ego, you're resurrected as a Christ, a true God, an Osiris. So the trade-off is, is, listen, I'll take it any day. Just give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> Meditation is becoming in tune with the undifferentiated, clear, un unmanifest nature of your own mind. It's bringing the mind home, returning it to its natural state. It's what in Zen is called seeing your original face before you were born. It is the Maha part of know about my heart. The ultimate part of it. Because through the process, you will undergo all four cycles of the Bardos while still alive and conscious. And when this meditation is completely mastered, 
It generates an experience of our true identity, the true nature of our being, God, realization. When properly done also, it will duplicate the same experience, the spirit experiences which are undergone in near death and afterlife experiences. It is the key to understand all the mysteries of life and existence. Holding the attention at the eye center, when this can be accomplished, the inner world becomes, the inner world comes into being the inner world. Right now, we're living in the outer world because we're not at the eye center. We don't live in, in our true state, in our true nature. So we are concerned with the outer world, what is going on there. That is our reality, not the reality that is. It is the experience that when realized the African sages would exclaim, Anukasa. The Hindu sages, Aham Brahmas. And the Muslim mystics, Anuluka. I am God. Consider this. If during your whole lifetime you have not encountered God, you will not encounter God at the time of your death. You will simply not have the spiritual capacity to recognize it. So, those are just some little tidbits that uh, I ran across. Now the difficulties and impediments. And some suggestions about those. Most, if not all of us, find it difficult on the path at first. We find it difficult maintaining regularity, um, doing it on a daily basis, doing it for the amount of time that we need to do it and find all kinds of reasons for not doing it. You know, any old excuse. You know, I gotta breathe so I can't meditate. You know, anything. And what we have to do when these things happen is to just fight those. Go back to the 13 good reasons why we meditate. We gotta put in that effort. We gotta be obedient. We gotta establish a routine. We gotta do all these things. But when we can't, when we make a mistake, we mustn't feel guilt or remorse or self-disgust. Because what happens then is we stop. Or we make more excuses. Because excuses feed on excuses. So we've got to go in the other direction. We've got to fight it. We've got to have the will to fight it. And this, this self-reproach is one of the biggest things that will knock us off the path, that will keep us from doing what it is we need to do. We have to get away from that because it doesn't matter what you do. The master loves you anyway. That's the kind of love that I'm talking about, that unconditional love. So you don't have to beat up on yourself. Just keep trying. Do your best and he'll take care of the rest. Uh, the same Babaji, while he was writing a letter to, to great master, also wrote a letter to another disciple. He said, you write, you're not able to do bhajan and that the effort is beyond you. Such an attitude is laziness and indifference. You mentally crave good food and tasty food and you have it twice daily. However, the practice of budging and simran bestows everything on us, and this spiritual practice is the very purpose for which the human form has been given to us. The human body is really a temple of God. 
and he can only be realized within it. Why then waste such a valuable gift? So he goes on to tell him about it. See, your job is not all that important. Your family is not all that important. They will be taken care of. Just as God takes care of you, he'll take care of your family, he'll take care of your job, he'll take care of anything that you're worried about. You know, we're not just the only things that he's seeing to that he's taking care of. Everything is being taken care of in the universe. All the destinies are being played out. All the karmas are being played out. We don't have to try to fix everybody. We can't fix ourselves. So it doesn't make sense to try to fix somebody else. Um, we get caught up in, in, you know, being this for this person and doing that for that person. And, and we think it's noble and, and this is what we're supposed to do because this is the right thing. This is the good thing to do. And we can't do anything for ourselves. The best thing that we can do for anybody is to meditate, is to practice, is to follow the instructions of the rule, is to make ourselves God realize. Then we can help somebody. But until that time, we're just marking time. And if we think we're doing something, that's just that ego lying to us again. When we started, most of us are new to this, this path. When you start on this, this, in this process, and on this journey, a lot of things change. Or well, as a matter of fact, your whole life changes. Or you'll find that it is necessary to make quite a few adjustments. We can't go about our daily activities, our work, engaging in, in the activities and entertainment and with our friends and with our families the way we were doing before. Because now, our time belongs to the Lord. All the time belongs to Him. But He doesn't ask for it all at once. We work up to that time. We work up to giving Him the whole 24 hours every day. But we start with the two and a half two and a half hours of meditation while we sit in a formal meditation assignment or position. But when we get up, we go into the moment to moment. And that is our self-observation, looking at what we are doing every single minute, second of the day. It takes time, takes practice, takes patience, because we're not going to be able to do it right away. But do it, we must. So you have to, you'll find yourself having to structure your day. You've got to look at when you're going to serve the Lord. That meditation time. The formal meditation. You've got to look at when you have to go to work or when you have to do what you have to do. But make no mistake about it. The meditation is the important thing in your life. The rest of the things do not matter. So what you want to do is, you structure them around your meditation. You don't structure your meditation around your life because that's just some more egoic activity. That's just you running something or thinking you're running something or just turning your back to the master and his instructions. So that's one of the things that's necessary that you do. Now, your morning meditation, and, and some people may not meditate in the morning. They may find that it's better, particularly people who work in strange and odd hours. But what you must try to do is find the best, your best time to serve the Lord, to do your meditation. Whenever you're at your best, that's when you should be doing your meditation. Now, usually for most of us, those of us who have day jobs in the work, the morning, because you slept, you've had a peaceful, restful night's sleep. The mind is not as scattered when you wake up in the morning. So that's usually the best time to do your meditation. And, and so that's when you do that, at the time when you are at your best. You give him your best because what you're at, he's been giving you his best 
all our lives. So now it's time for us to give back. It's time for us to realize what we've been given, blessings that have been showered upon us, and show some love and some gratitude for them. So in turn, we give him our best. So uh, at night we've been we've been uh, we've been instructed that before we retire at night we should do some self-examination. We should look at our daily activities, see to what extent we were um, victims of the five bad boys, as Sackbar calls them. The five perversions, the lust, the greed, the anger, the vanity, and the attachment. Now, what do we do today that we really could have avoided had we been doing our moment to moment? Had we been self-observing? Had we been actually practicing? Just look at it. Just look at it. And then as you do this, and you retire for the night, start your sermon. Say your five holy names as you go to sleep. Take them to sleep with you. Get a head start on the morning meditation so that when you wake up, you're right there ready to start your formal meditation. You'll find that doing this helps you to sleep better. Keeps away those nightmares and disturbing dreams. <laughs> It helps. Great um, Master says, my Raji says, that it is your mind that raises all the problems that you have, that causes all the suffering that you do. We create that in our conceptual world. And at the time of meditation, it is your job, it is your duty to stop this mind. The guru is not going to stop. You have to do it. Now, you cannot yield before the enemy. The enemy is your mind. You have to fight. You have to be a warrior. You have to want, you have to have the will to fight, to get that mind under control. Because if you don't control your mind, then your mind controls you. And as we all know, the mind is a very bad master. But it can be our best friend. We've got to be in control of the mind. is the key. It should become as much a part of you as breathing. See, we don't control our bodily functions. We don't control our breathing, our circulatory system, uh, the activity that goes on in our brain. We don't control any of that. All that's a gift, part of what we should be grateful for. Everything that goes on, that keeps us alive as we know ourselves, we have nothing to do with. Try to stop breathing. Try to stop your circulation from, from moving around your body. Just try. You can't do it because you didn't start it. It was a gift, just like this precious human body was a gift. 
So what you want to do is you want to get to the point where, and we go back to the 13 good reasons, you want to form this habit, this simmering habit. You want to just do the simmer so that whenever we have a spare moment, whenever we're not doing anything, and, and if you really look at it, it's a whole lot of times we're not doing anything. <laughs> that we could be doing something. And meditation is not an option. When we took initiation, those of you who are waiting to take initiation, we promised at that time that we would abide by the rules. We made vows. It's just like when you get married, that vow to love, protect, honor, and blah, blah, to death, and all that kind of stuff. Now, it was sort of like that, but this is more important than that vow. The teetotalism and the, the, the ahimsa and the vegetarianism and all of that, we said we would do that. But the most important one is we would meditate. And we, we, we expected to do what we said. And we said it, we gave our word. So the meditation now is not an option, but it has to be a way of life. It has to be formally and moment to moment. We must get to the point where we do everything meditatively. Would the guru do this? Would the master do this? What would he think? We have to get to that point. We do nothing without the master then we, we can say we're making some progress on the path. But until we get to that point, we got a whole lot of work to do. There's nothing free in this world. And the highest price of all is charged for spiritual liberation. That's total commitment. Not halfway, not half ass, but wholeheartedly. And this is the biggest barrier for most people. But despite this, the greatest commitment is made by the Master. And we should only approach Him for spiritual help and trust that whatever happens to us is in our own best interest. Because we're not doing it he is doing. When we, the disciples, take one step toward the master, he takes ten to a hundred steps toward us. So we need to think about that. We dipping and diving like a drunk man, take one step forward and two steps back. And he's steady, right there waiting with open arms to receive us. All we have to do is just keep moving forward. Just keep moving forward. All of our problems are solved in meditation. Meditation is all we need to achieve everything in life. Now this meditation is, 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 I mean, it's something. It's something. It's a big topic too. The ultimate purpose of the human body is to meditate. We don't have to worry about those vital things that keep us alive that I mentioned before. So all we have to do is meditate. That's what our bodies were designed for. We could have been dogs and cats and trees and ants and uh, corn and cotton and all this other kind of stuff. But we were given this precious human form to do what? to go back home, to go back to the Creator, to realize who we are. And to do that, we have to meditate. The Creator has, the creator has so constructed man that he is able, when properly informed and trained, to place himself in conscious communication with the entire universe. 
I mean, you know, we do little stuff and we think we're doing something. We're not doing anything. But we have the capacity to do everything. I mean, we just can't imagine what, what bliss and happiness God realization is. Because if we could, then probably some of us would be working a little harder. When we do our simran, we're actually controlling the mind. We're keeping out those those thoughts that, that take us astray, make us, you know, that the senses, the egoity that we're living in all the time. But when we don't do simran, then the mind controls us. Simple as that. Rain in this crazy, I thought this was good. Rain in this crazy horse called mine, which is always at a gallop. G-A-L-A-P. Greed, anger, lust, attachment, and pride. Gallop. Causing it to run off in all directions. Whatever we may do, and whatever, in whatever circumstance we may live, our meditation should be our main concern. And it should never, never, ever be sacrificed for anything. Ever. And a saint is a sinner who never gave up. You want to be a saint? Don't give up. Don't be like, like one of the little frogs in the pail was. There, these two frogs were in this pail of milk. And um, they were swimming around, swimming around, trying to get out, trying to get out. They couldn't, so this one frog got tired and he panicked. He said, well, I'm tired. I'm not going to do it anymore. So he drowned, of course. The other frog kept swimming. He swam all night. He swam all the next day. And pretty soon he felt the milk getting hard. He had swam so hard and furiously, he turned the milk into butter. He hopped on top of the butter and hopped out of the pail. But now the other one was dead. So we don't want to be dead in the milk like we were dead in the water. We don't want to be dead in the milk. <laughs> now, well, I got some more time. I got some more stuff. But um, I also have a message for you. So if, if we finish and um, before 2 o'clock, then we can just wind shop it a little bit. Because Guru Sahib said he would be here at 2 o'clock. So we're going, he said, could you entertain him till you know all this? I said, sure. Of course, you always say sure. You say yes to whatever he says. Um, now, I do have a few little things that I ran across that were, that were, um, they kind of tickle my feet. Um, one of them was this, there was a um, disciple who wrote this article in one of the pamphlets, and, and I must have looked through about 10 or 15 pamphlets, about five or six books and stuff just trying to find some little things to, to bring with me today. And, and I thought this was pretty good because I never thought about it like this. What he says is that we're doing sermon all the time, but we're just doing perishable sermon. It's sermon that doesn't last. You know, we think about our jobs, we think about our money, we think about our bills, that's sermon. You know, that's all it is. So what he said is that oh, mothers are thinking about their children, Fathers are thinking about whatever, not that you, but all of these things are similar. I mean, it's the same process at work. It's just the wrong kind of similar. So what you want to do is you want to turn that into the right kind of similar. You want to do the permanent similar. You want to do the similar that we learned when we initiated. Because God only opens the door when you shut all the other doors so that he can open the tenth door. Which means you have to cut out, cut out.
cut off all your attachments. Get rid of all those other four perversions and become pure. Remember, the Bible says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You've got to become pure. Then I thought this was kind of humorous. Um, some disciples want shortcuts. They say, Master, save me from Simran, Budget, Dion. <laughs> <laughs> you do everything for me. Do my budget, do my sermon, and control my mind too. <laughs> they wanted to do everything. If they're in school, they said, I want you to read the books for me and pass the test. And everything. But this is what some disciples do. You know, some of us probably fall into the same. We back to that prayer instead of the meditation. As I said before, this is a this is a real, real big topic. And as I was going through and, and reading uh, a lot of the articles uh, referred to other books and articles that maybe some of you want to read, but not before you read these art this article about meditation. Because it, it really clears up. It really clears up everything you want to know about meditation. It takes you through the bar those stages. It tells you you know, how you're going to die, what it's going to look like. And if you've ever seen anybody die, you can actually see them going through the process of dissolution. You can see them losing the different parts, and, and it, it's, it's not a, it, it is not a pretty thing to see. And we're all going to go through that. And like I said, pay me now or pay me later. So I don't want to pay later. There was a, this, this one poem that I ran across uh, by an anonymous uh, poet on meditation. Whether he replies or not, keep calling him, ever calling in the chamber of continuous prayer. Whether he comes or not, believe he is ever approaching nearer to you with each urging of your heart's love. Whether he answers or not, keep entreating him, even if he makes no reply in the way you expect. Ever know that in some subtle way he will respond. In the darkness of your deepest prayers, know that he is playing hide and seek with you. And in the middle of the dance of life, disease and death, if you keep calling him undeterred by his seeming silence, you will receive his answer. So I thought that was kind of inspirational. And I talked a little bit about destiny, and there's another little piece in there about destiny. And it's entitled, Destiny is Immutable. Regarding your feeling of sympathy for suffering people, it is quite natural. But mere sympathy does not help them in any way. In fact, by dwelling on or sharing their suffering, there are two discontented and miserable persons now instead of one. <laughs> sympathy is no doubt good, and we should try to give whatever help we can. But at the same time, remember, everyone in this world is reaping what he has sown in a past life. And that destiny is immutable. The world will always remain a place of suffering and misery and will never become a paradise. In fact, life in this world is made up of both joys and sorrows. Therefore, the saints tell us to get out of this world by a births and deaths of joys and sorrows once and for all. The only time to achieve this goal is while in the human body. And the human body is not given to us 
in every birth. Remember, we don't have to come back here as you know. The, well, the next time I'll do it right. You may not get a next time for another million years. So now's the time that we need to do it right. We get it only after millions of lives, and it is very. It is a very rare and precious gift not to be wasted upon the perishable things and objects of this world. Aim of human life is the achievement of God's realization. And if we do not find a way to achieve it, we have wasted the human life with which the Lord has blessed us. No questions, right? <laughs> I mean, I, I do the best I can, and, and what I can do, the rest of the rest of you will help me with, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, did you, I, I totally agree with everything you said. You have a beautiful way of um, <coughs> compiling it, like a natural teacher. But I would like to know, <coughs> your own uh, perspective, did you come to this conclusion through the faith <coughs> in this, or through recognition of this, or through self-discovery. When you say conclusion, I mean, you obviously believe that. How did you arrive there? Through faith? Of course. Yeah. Of course. Uh, I'm, I'm arriving there, and I have to say. Um, part from experience, that as we meditate, and I have been meditating a long time, but little subtle things happen to you, um, that, that if, if, you can, if you can be aware enough um, you see, and and then with, see, I'm I'm pig-headed and stubborn and all these things. So it, it you know if I see it, the world will really see it because I'm probably the last person to see anything. Um, and and you know if we just become just become mindful, aware that you know we're just blessed every day. If we can get out of the bed. If we can walk when we get out of the bed. If we can move our limbs. You know, we can talk. I mean, the very fact that, that, that we can walk around, that these things that I mentioned are going on, if we just focus on that, I didn't do this. Somebody had to do it. So I'm believing that somebody is the master. It's Google. It's God. So what do I have to do? So I'm trying to get to the point to do my part. That's, that's, that's the right view. Well, I'm, I'm getting there to trying. Uh, yesterday in the wine shop, we were talking, we were talking about uh, uh, the form of meditation as um, versus the moment to moment. And I was just wondering, you know, just for all of us, if you could just kind of reiterate how both of them are just as important, how they play into one another. Interesting that you should ask that question. Uh, the form of meditation, <coughs> I think everybody knows about that. That's when we actually sit in the asana for the position for our. Uh, Time, two and a half hours, two and a half to three hours, usually in the morning. Now the moment to moment that we were talking about yesterday, until yesterday, I was confused about it. And I, I wrote it in my report today to Guru Prasad. But the moment to moment is, is what, I guess some other terms for it would be abiding, abiding in the faith or abiding in the truth, or, or being aware every single moment. Um, of everything that you're doing, and um, this keeps you away from egoic. It keeps you away from from the Maya. It keeps you away from the click clack that we usually engage in. But it's just just all the time being aware of God is really essential. What the moment to moment is, and in this awareness, you act differently. You feel differently. You are different. So if we can get to this point where we can exercise, practice this moment to moment and go a long way in helping in our spiritual progress, God's realization. Is that about what we said?
piece of information. But more importantly, I'm going to ask you, because I've never heard you say it, perhaps you've said it, who's on God? How did you come to the path? What brought you here? And what were some of your experiences, spiritual experience, religious experience, prior to coming to this path? Okay, let me answer your second question first. Um, I guess I've always been uh, religious or, or a spiritual seeker. Uh, and it, I can remember when I was a little girl, eight years old, I was in the back of my house in the backyard, and it was a post back there. You know how you go to, you go to Sunday school and they say, well, God is everywhere and God is watching you and stuff. So I was walking toward this post, right? And I said, I don't believe that. I don't believe God is watching you and that he, he guides you every step and all of that. I walked dead into the post looking at it. <laughs> now, that was like a rude awakening. I mean, I was eight years old. But <laughs> it, you know, it kind of let me, it, it kind of you know, turned me on. So I said, well, you know, maybe he is watching. Not that it had any real effect, but that <laughs> did happen to me. And um, another experience that I had, I was about 15. I was, any, the older people in here might remember Reverend Cobb's church on 43rd Street. Uh, they had a, a, like a youth thing, and they were having a convention in Detroit. I was riding a bus, and I was looking out the window of the bus, and the sun was setting. You know how sometimes the sun is real big and round and orange? Um, and I was looking at it. And I mean, I looked at it to the point that I, that I no longer knew where I was. I mean, actually, I was probably meditating, but didn't even know it. And then, I guess it was only for a few seconds or so, but, but when I came back to myself, I like felt refreshed. You know, it was like I had taken a nap. Now, that was another kind of spiritual thing that I had. And I was raised in the Church of Baptist and you know, all of that. I read the Bible, um, and, and I guess what happened is that I, you, at some point, you begin to say, well, you know, it must be something more than this, because this, this is not getting it. So you start to look for things, you, you know, uh, I went into the, the metaphysical thing, uh, before, just before I came to the past. I had been in a, um, in a group that all they did was read and listen to tapes. And it was just called reality. You didn't have to do anything. It was like where you get to afterwards. But it didn't have any way you could get there. And, and for 10 years, I had been reading and listening to tapes. And, and this one lady that I know who's, who's doing this, you know, she kind of uh, is, is like real, real spiritual. Um, but then I met Bogwin at a, at a workshop that he gave uh, last year in February, and it was on anger. It was one of his anger management workshops. Um, and the place was packed. I had to sit on a table. And so I'm sitting there and I'm listening. And it dawned on me, I said, well, everybody I know is angry. I'm angry. I mean, you know, based on what he was saying. And so afterwards, you know, he had this one book with one book. So I jumped off the table and ran up there to get the book. Right, lady beat me to it. She got the book. So I said, dang, I came up to buy the book. He said, here's one for you gave me the bar goes, right? <laughs> so I looked at the book. I said, well, you know, this is not about anger. So I, <laughs> so I took... I took the book to school with me, and some of you might know my friend Linda, who was coming with me at one point. And I said, uh, I got this book. And she said, what is it? I told her, she said, well, let me read it. I gave it to her, let her read it. So she read it. She said, well, you know, it's just the same old thing. So I said, okay, then I started reading. And I'm saying, because she's an English teacher, right? So I'm figuring if she says it's the same old thing, then, you know, she's English. She knows about stuff. But I started reading, I said, oh, no, no, I haven't read anything like this before. So Bhagwan had said that uh, that Saturday they were meeting at, at Thurgood Marshall. Now, the only thing he said was Thurgood Marshall. Now, I'm thinking school. Thurgood Marshall is a school. 
So I passed by 75th and Racine. I'm looking for this school, right? Mm -hmm. So one time I passed, I, and I almost didn't stop. I looked at the library, and the name of the library was Thurgood Marshall. So I got out, and I went in. And, and Bilal came in and was setting up. And, and you know, I was looking around, and saying, Man, nobody was there. I was the only one. <laughs> so then I asked Bilal, well, is this the place where the angry man is? So he said, yeah, yeah, this is the place. So then I sat down. Um, and I listened to the discourse. Um, so then I went home and I thought about it. Now, can't nobody sit up and talk about all that stuff and not look at a note. Now, I mean, he's just talking, talking. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I said, what's this little man talking? I said, no, he can't do this. He can't do this twice. I said, I'm going back. <laughs> so I went back the second time. So I think the second time, you know how sometimes when it was just a few of us there, he said, well, you know, come closer, come closer. So then I took my chair and went up there too. And so did Linda. So we were sitting there listening to him talking stuff. And um, then Linda asked this question. Uh, it's something like, well, you know, tell me how to be God in real life. I mean, you know, something that, you know, would take a lifetime or two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when she asked the question, I just started crying. I mean, tears just started running down. <laughs> and Goose, I mean, he said, what's the matter with you? You <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I just didn't know. But after that second time, you know, I just knew I had to come back. I mean, I just, I just knew I had to come back. So Linda and I would talk. She said, well, I'm getting it this year. I said, yeah, me too. I'm, I'm going to get it this year too. So then, you know, they tricked me. They said, well, you know, now you can't just get initiated. you got to go through the six-month period and all this other kind of stuff. But um, that's, that's pretty much how I got to, you know, it's just, I guess, luck, grace, uh, being in the right place at the right time. Right. I, I, I'm, I'm just sitting up here bubbling and stopping because just to think that uh, you have not been on the path that long, but yet it's still you have a whole plethora mm -hmm. yes. of information and knowledge and insight. And I'm very grateful that the Creator, this time around, put me in your company. <laughs> you are a very incredible sister, and uh, I, I just appreciate you because, again, you bring out so much truthfulness. And uh, it's just a, a pleasure just sitting here and listening to you because you just crack me up. <laughs> <laughs> With all I do respect and love and honor the Guru Das. I've never seen anyone ask a servant as you are on this path. You are truly a remarkable woman. And, uh, again, I thank God for being your company. And thank you for, for teaching us. Wow. Thank you. And, and uh, I must say, your know, talk is cheap. Hmm. And, and I have to, I used to tell my son that when he was a baby all the time. Uh, because he would say things and he would do just the opposite. And I would tell him talk is cheap. And I have to keep reminding myself that talk is cheap. Because, you know, as I struggle with my meditation, and, and as I can't do things that, that I, you know, other people say they can do and stuff, I wonder about my sincerity. And, my, and, and, and I try to be honest with myself. You know, my thing was, I'd always tell people, don't be hypocrites. And then I found out that I was one of the biggest hypocrites that I knew. You, you find out things about yourself. And, and so as you say that, you know, it, it, you know, it sounds good and, and all of that. And, but like I said, at this point, you know, I can't walk on water. You know, I can't do any of the other things. And, and I just hope that I can grow to have the love and devotion that's necessary in order to, to take full advantage of this path and, and really to become God in your life. Um, and, and I wrote in, also in my, in my report this morning that, um, you know, I told everybody jokingly last week, I said, you can't ask me any elder jokes. I mean, ask me any elder questions. <laughs> and, and I had, because someone asked uh, Amanda Ra last week, about um, 
urgency because you know we're, we're kind of like the, the elders here and you know and I thought about it I said you know to have a sense of urgency also says that you have a lack of faith or that you really don't believe because you're right where you are and where you're supposed to be and to be anxious about something like that is just diametrically opposed to the teaching so if you believe and you understand, then there is no urgency. Whatever will be, will be. And whatever you need, you have. Wherever you are. You know, it's like 30 years ago, if I met Guru Sahib, I might have, you know, walked on by. Or, you know, so I'm, I'm supposed to be here now. And, and I'm, I thank God that I am. Um, <laughs> Sadatha, then Rani Kumar, and then Morality Maiden. <laughs> so that Could you talk a little bit about the road that fear plays in meditation on the path um, as well as specifically meditation but the role that fear plays in, well actually the role that fear plays in, in uh, getting in our way of practicing from the moment to moment Well, from, from what I understand, the fear, fear prompts all the five negative perversions. Um, fear of not being enough or having enough makes us greedy. Um, a fear of not being wanted to love makes us have lust, and, and this might not be. Uh, fear of, of uh, not belonging makes us attached. So it's, it's this fear which underlies the whole, uh, the whole egoic activity. You know, we want to hold on to something, and we're afraid if we turn it loose. See, the, the path is unknown. You know, spiritual way is, is abstract. It's not something that we've ever encountered before. So we don't know about it. We hesitate. We're doubtful. We, we fear losing what it is we think we have, which is nothing. And, and it's just, you know, it, nothing to be afraid of, I guess, but fear itself, somebody said. So, you know, that's, that's pretty much my understanding. Other thing. Uh, on. I was just going to say that um, I disagree with what you said just a little bit about it not being an urgency because everybody is what it's supposed to be. And that it's, it's my own opinion that you do have to have some urgency or else you would uh, turn compilations into years of uh, not making any progress. Uh, my view is kind of like uh, I'm uh, running towards a moving train. And in running towards this moving train, I'm dropping my baggage, you know, my attachments and things like that. And, and to me, that means there is an urgency there. So I was just going to make that comment. Okay. I didn't mean not have an urgency about the past. I meant my personal, because of my age, it's like maybe I only got two years, oh. so I got to do this. This was what I was talking about. And I, you know, you mentioned about the training, because I, I was thinking that, you know, one of the things I was going to say, I just, like had little cutesy stuff to say, uh, you know, to kind of break the tension and stuff. And it's like, you know, initiation and what happens. Um, you know, uh, Guru Sahib gives us the ticket. But we have to catch and ride the train. But if we just keep the ticket in our hand and never use it, we'll never go anywhere. We'll just be at the station. So you brought that down. You don't get me for <laughs> <laughs>
would, would ask you if there's something you want to say, if there's, if there's something that you, if any question, you always say that I don't know nothing. I don't know nothing. See, y'all don't know nothing. I need to get this thing because I don't know nothing. Well, you know, we care a lot, you and I, and uh, I, I just want to tell you uh, from my heart that you know, the leaps and bounds that you've made is, is uh, it's incredible. And the fact of the matter is that you always do this. Now, you're sharing with us. And I do feel blessed. And I, we are shot with a lot of grace because of you. Thank you. Well, it's just in there. I'm just one of you sitting up here. I mean, you know, we all sitting up here. I'm a composite of all of you sitting up here. And, and I'm not here by myself. But Guru Sahib told me this morning that um, we, meaning he and I, would deliver the message. I couldn't do that by myself. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I couldn't even begin to do that. Um, just sitting here, you know, I mean, it, it's, it, you, you got to, you, know, <laughs> you have to have something to move you. There, there has to be a grace. Um, a love, you know, somebody greater than us who, who helps and watches over and nourishes and loves us and lets us do, helps us to do the things that we do. And because I was, I was, you know, I'm saying, wow, you know, if, if he's going to be, if I'm going to be the conduit, if I'm going to be the, 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 the um, wire through which this message comes, you know, maybe I'm not receptive receptive enough. Maybe I don't have enough faith. Maybe I haven't meditated enough. Maybe, you know, I had all kinds of anxiety. The phone rang. I said, you must have been reading my mind. I mean, it was just uncanny. It, it really was. And, but I was, then afterwards, I was just giddy. I mean, you know how, you know, you know, when you look here, you go into the show. You know, I, I mean, I just got, I almost couldn't, you know how you, you know, when you talk to him, you just get discombobulated. But, but then I wasn't afraid anymore. I mean, I, I, I knew that it would be all right because I wouldn't be up here by myself. Of course, I'm never by myself, but you know, I don't have the sense enough to know that all the time. But thank you. My smile, down my eyes. I gave up a bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was worth it. Uh, beautiful. Um, in the 10 months that you've been on the path, and now that you, you know, you're meditating, and you were talking about um, uh, routine as a pole to pleasure, can you explain to the ones who maybe just got initiated, who may be struggling with routine, how you made the transition from routine and boredom to it being a pleasurable experience? I just kept doing it. <laughs> I mean, I just, <laughs> you, no, wait a minute, that's not exactly the truth. What happened was, uh, because I guess in the beginning, you know, I, would, I felt it was all right about, well, today I did an hour and a half, the next day I did two and a half, and the other day I only did an hour. And you know, I, I didn't feel too badly about that. I thought that it was okay, uh, because uh, you know, guru would understand, right? <laughs> so we had a one-on-one -on -one, one time, and I asked him, I said, well, why, why am I struggling so much? I mean, what, I mean, I, you, you know, and, and he looked at me, he said, um, oh, he was just beautiful. <laughs> he said, um, in order for us to make progress on the path, we must follow the injunctives. We must put in the time. We mu I mean, he went on, you know, just, so when he finished that, I thought about what he had said, and I played the tape over. And I said, uh-huh, he told me off in a nice way. But what he said was, you must do what it is that you have been asked to do. Explicitly. You, you know, you don't have to. I mean, you can't expect progress when you haven't done your part. I hadn't done my part. So I said, well, I guess he told me. Now, at the time he told me that I was sick. And it was real, real hard. I didn't didn't miss it, but sometimes I didn't do I didn't do it very long. Um, 
But that's because I'm thinking about me, I'm thinking about my body, I'm thinking about my pain. And, and I couldn't separate because I, my spiritual development was not to the point where I could separate myself you know, from, from that witnessing self so that I could go through the pain and stuff. And, but I, I said, you know, if I ever get well, I'm going to do my time. And I got well, and I still was kind of, you know, shaky during the time. But that, that kept ringing in my ears, that injunctive. That, and, and I asked mm -hmm. about that one, one Sunday. You know, you, you, you have to do, you got to do what you got to do. You got to do that. And, you know, I just made up in my mind. I thought, I'm going to do the two and a half. I, you know, if I'm hanging on one leg or falling asleep, or I'm sitting there. Because if you sit long enough, every day, it's going to get better. It's going to get better. You know, the pain will get better or you forget about it or whatever. But if you, but you've got to stay with it. You've got to stay with it. And you, you can't miss a day. You miss a day, it's like missing two months. If you miss a day, it like throws you back so that when you go back, you almost go through the same thing that you went through initially. So you got to, you got to keep going. You got to keep at it. You got to keep Now, I'm, next week, I'm going on a trip. Now, this is the first time that I've really been anywhere since I started meditating. And I'm trying to figure out how I can take my budget stick with me on the plane and they won't think it's a weapon. But, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, it's not, no, no, but, but, well, but I'm, but you know, because you want to do, you know, now I've been on like a couple of days and stuff like this, but I'm going to be gone a week from Friday, from Monday to Friday now. The weekends are taken. So I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to do that. Um, you know, it's because it's having to get up in the morning, you know, disturb the people and all of that kind of stuff. At first, I told my husband I wasn't going to try to divorce me. <laughs> I said, no, I, I, was, I was really worried. I said, now, nah. he said, what do you mean you're not going? I said, well, you know, I, and then I really, finally, I got nerve enough to say, but you know, I have to get up at three o'clock in the morning. I don't want to bother the teacher and all that. You know. And then he went on to say about family and you know how you have to, you know, you need to see your family and all this kind of stuff. But he's feeling and stuff. Uh, so then I said, well, maybe I can work it out. Maybe I can, you know, I'm getting up though. I just want to say that. <laughs> I, I will get up, and, 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 um, so I, I work it out somehow. Um, but that's Dhammaji. That's, that's what I do. I just so it's a pleasure for you now. It's not a it's not a struggle to do it. It's not a struggle to get up. If I don't set the clock, I wake up within ten or fifteen minutes at the same time because a couple of times you're tired, you go to bed, and and that's not me waking up. So I figured I could with bad, you know, somebody's trying to tell me something. So I get on up. Now, sometimes I might fall back to sleep for 10 or 15 minutes or something like that. But then I can remember what, um, um, what Babika said, you know, you fall back to sleep 10 or 15 minutes, it doesn't help. <laughs> I mean, you know, what does it do? You, know, you may as well get up when the, when the alarm goes off. But, um, you know, I'm not seeing lights and dancing and stuff, uh, and and that's not, you know, that's not my purpose. You know, I'm just trying to trying to be able to, to follow the instructions. You know, whatever happens, happens. And if nothing happens, that's okay too. I'm gonna be there. So once, I guess, once you make up your mind, what you're gonna do, you can do that. But you gotta make your mind.
Mother Day was a special thing, you know. And we, I felt myself, could not move. He was speaking in the bathroom. And we could not move out that door. We were like listening to you, um, maybe comment on some of that education. Anyway, mom and talking. But I learned respect for you because for some reason I felt the strength in you that I knew I couldn't, I was stuck in the right good spot. But the question is, you said earlier that karma um, is destined, that we are born to live by our karma. And that in meditating, we burn this karma. And when we're burning the karma, wait a minute, wait a minute. you don't burn your destiny karma. That's not the problem. That's not okay, the this is the question because I was confused on it, and I, I thought maybe I was going to ask you how does that alter it. Okay, now there's three times the karma. There's the destiny karma, um, uh, karma. That's what we're going through now. And then there's the karma we are making up, you know, as we go along, you know, by our thoughts, our actions, and our words. And that's kriyama. You'll see these things in the book. Then there's sinship. Sinship is the stored up karma, the karma that we brought from us from all our past lives and stuff. That's the karma that we're burning. We're burning that karma. But we're also taking care of the karma we are making up as we go. The only thing that we're not doing anything with is the destiny. That's going to play itself out. But by the grace of the guru and our meditation, we can, it's like, instead of like being, your arm being cut off, it can be like a pinprick because, because of your, your devotion and your love and your meditation and the fact that you have been initiating that you're on the path. So we can mitigate some of that. Can't change it. Now, is that, is that right? <laughs> Well, let's see. <laughs> Speak later. But um, we'll sit here until it comes. So if you know, there's any. Shasti, there's any other question? I think so. But another thing I'd like to point out is as, as each of you gets your chance to sit up here. It's, it's really not as hard as you would imagine sitting there, simply because you, you do have, you know, it's like everybody's sending their love and their encouragement and their support to you. You're not doing it by yourself. As a matter of fact, you're not doing it by yourself because you're actually just a, you know, just a vessel that's being used. But then you get the additional help from the from the sangha, from the audience, from the guests, um, that love is actually felt when you sit here. You, you can actually feel feel that from you. So you you really it is it's really a privilege and an honor to be here. And and when you get here, you'll see you'll see what I mean. Semi. Concentration. Where well, some explanation? I'm not there. I can tell you that. But um, actually, the most difficult part of the path is being able to draw your attention to the high center, to to fight off that mind, to control it, to stop those thoughts, and and to become empty, so that you can be filled by the grace. Um, you, it happens in stages. First, you have to <coughs> learn to sit for the time. Then you have to go through the moment to moment, and and, and you gotta you gotta just you know keep this one pointed view, this single view. Uh, you gotta abide um, in God. 
because all of this is necessary in order to, to take your attention away from where it's going to want to go. Our attention, of course, goes where our desires are. Whatever we desire is where our attention will be. So wherever your attention is, you know, whether you want to admit it or not, that's what you want. That's what you want to do. You know, if you sleep in the morning or, or you know, you want to, you know, you eat too much or you buy too much or you do unnecessarily, unnecessary stuff, that's where your attention is. It's where your desires are. So what you have to replace, you have to replace your desires for worldly things to, to a desire for spiritual things. And until you do that, you won't be able to concentrate. And concentration is the last thing that you do. You've got to, you've got to stop the, the scattering of your mind. You got to all the thoughts running through here, this, this, and that. You know, all you got to do is close your eyes and just, you know. And you're not doing that. They're just there. But you've got to learn to control it. And then you got to the attention. You got to get the attention to come. Then after the attention comes is when the concentration, the concentration, the concentration is the last thing that you will do. And that's why the, the Dion helps when you can focus on the, and contemplate on the form of the master. You see, all these aids will help us, but we got to do them. See, we, we live in this world of, of egoity and maya all the time because that's what we're engaged in. But we have to withdraw from that. And until we can withdraw, I mean totally withdraw from that, you will not take your attention to the eye center. And the eye center is where the real path begins. You're not on the path until you have met the master inside, until he has actually appeared to you. And then you begin to ascend. But until that point in time, we're trying to get there. And that's our work. And that's the most difficult.
but since I was there on his first birthday, that it only be appropriate that I be here on his last first birthday. It is a extremely important day that commemorates the day that you were born because it was on this day, a day just like today, 40 years ago, that you were given this opportunity that is this human existence. And ordinarily, in the usual man and woman, the first 40 years are just wondered. So much of it was wondered on your infancy and childhood where you were simply lost and those things that children are lost in, fascinated by toys and games. And then many more years was equally wasted during the period that was your adolescence, captivated by the sweet aroma of women. You, like so many of us, simply squandered your adolescence as well. And then comes early adulthood, marriage, career, school, and all of those kinds of commitments that consume you to the point of exhaustion. And again, still forgetting the purpose for which you were born. Usually by the age of 40, if we are fortunate, we begin to again and recover an awareness that we were born for a much higher purpose than what we have been spending our life up to that point involved in. So this is a critical birthday for you because you have reached the halfway point, statistically speaking, through this life. And for those of you who don't know this man, as I know this man, a few things should be said about him to help you understand why I will give him the name that I have chosen for him today. I try but bear in mind, Lieutenant, that today is your spiritual birthday and that from this day forward, you are to truly address those things that are appropriate for a spiritual life. Now you have already wasted 40 years in pursuit of happiness. A child lieutenant was born with a predilection to always seek others' advice, help, aid in his quest for happiness. He had that ability to surrender, to submit, to seek out. He was born like this. It was not a product of books, such songs, my influence, Bilal influence, no way. He brought these some scholars with him into this birth. Never fully trusting his own mind. Somehow instinctively understanding that my own mind can deceive me understanding instinctively that if I relied solely on my mind, there's every possibility that I will miss it. And so he has always sought others' input in every major area of his life. He has never approached anything without seeking, soliciting, hoping to find knowledge that was more certain than his own. And so he has spent the first 40 years of his life in such a search. But in this next 40 years, you see, Lieutenant, it should be dedicated to turning within yourself. He has never turned within himself in search of his knowledge. Hence, he has never found it. And all of the advice that was given to him proved to come up short. He followed it with great devotion. And dedication. But whenever you are following knowledge that is 
arising outside of your own inner awareness, then that knowledge can never deliver the goods that you seek. So he has been a man of little knowledge, a man in search of the little knowledge. Ordinary, usual, of the worldly variety, available in books and conversations with other people. I call you today to die to that life and to be born now onto a search for the real knowledge that can only be attained within yourself. Because unless you encounter this great knowledge, then you, like everybody else, will simply die miserable, suffering, incomplete, unhappy. And you will become more and more bitter you will become bitter at those very people that you solicited for advice and then blame them for your failed attainment of happiness. You will become very cynical, very angry, very miserable because you have been trying to rely on others' knowledge. Their knowledge has not even delivered happiness for them. What makes you think it can produce happiness? The knowledge that leads to happiness is everyone's private, personal work. You have to get that yourself. That cannot be given to you from the outside. You cannot caucus and convene to get that. And you have been searching for the knowledge that leads to the capacity to live a life that is characterized by happiness and fulfillment. You have been seeking that knowledge in other people. You will never find it cannot be found. It does not exist in other people's advice. I don't care who advice it is. At this point, you must take a stand now, and you must do that which has to be done, which is enter into this great ordeal that is spiritual life and practice to the point that you can break through and access that knowledge that you are in search of in others inside of your own. Therefore, I have decided that in order to keep you reminded of your appropriate direction of search for knowledge, to bestow upon you the name Mahajana. Mahajana, Maha means great. Jana means knowledge. And this is what we all are striving for, the Mahajana, the great knowledge that knowledge that produce happiness. Please understand me, if your knowledge is not producing happiness, it does not qualify as knowledge. It may be information, great, but information doesn't produce happiness. Information does not transform. We each must find the great knowledge, the Mahajana, because it's only the Mahajana that can deliver the happiness that you are searching. And you must be clear about it. You must take a vow that with the remainder of your life you will dedicate it to the pursuit of this Mahajana. And I've already told you that you can only find it within yourself. So therefore you truly must enter into this ordeal that is silent. And you must come inside of this body. And you must find it that will make your life a great celebration, just a great joy, just cheer bliss. You must become convicted from this moment on that you can no longer rely on the information that you have so desperately been seeking in other people. You must truly see that these other people themselves do not have any mind. And with their ordinary knowledge, they have not even been able to make their own lives happy. Depending on them, how will you make your life happy? You must truly access the inner recesses of your own consciousness in which is stored this Mahajana. It was put there for you. But you must become clear about this thing. As we all must be. Whenever your name is called, it should remind you of the task that still sets before you. 
and you should live up to this need. You should make every effort in your life to earn the right to be referred to as Mahajana. You must really attain great knowledge. Not the knowledge that you can get in books. Not the knowledge that you picked up in your university studies. You have much of that. But that is little knowledge. It is not the Sogai, as the Dogon call it, great knowledge. Let this be considered your debut into the world again for the first time. Look upon it as a new birth. It's your spiritual birthday. On this day, remember it. It was the day you were born into spiritual life, in it? Find this thing, Mahajan. It is the only thing worth searching for in this life. And unless you attain this Mahajan, then you too will simply be miserable. You will not be spared. You are not exceptional. Nobody is. No Mahajan. No happiness. I don't know how to do I'm done with you. <laughs> Next, Donna. She's a good wife. When Gurumurthy indicated an interest in spiritual things, long before he came to the house of God, she did not stand in his way. She gave him room in his life to become all that he could be. Gurumurthy loves music. And she learned to fall in love with music too. Because the music was important to her beloved. She herself also sacrificed so that not only will her husband be happy, but her children. She chose to forego some of her own ambitions for the benefit of this man. Sometimes, Guru Murti, you don't know what she gave her. The children do not know what she gave her. But much was given for your sake. And she has stood with you. And you love her very much because of that quality. A child would have to you, thought you were the only one that's And grabbed her and made her your own. But you can <laughs> no longer deprive the rest of her. <laughs> We're on to it. <laughs> <laughs> and we slowly have fallen in love with her, too. There's something about Donna Maggi that makes you gravitate to her, even the children. And she's the kind of woman that can love beyond the context of her own family. 
There is no particular status in that mother who is only able to love her own children. That is a very ordinary kind of mother. It is typical, usual, mediocre, ordinary. That is. But when you're a great wife, you can also now function as a great mother. And she has extended her love to every child that comes within her. And she's capable and inclined and always involved in doing something. You know, it's really rare to observe someone doing something good. Almost always every activity that you do is associated with your own ego ambition, disguised, modified, but fundamentally arising out of your own selfishness and self -sinners. Dhanamaji has that rare ability, that natural inclination, that predisposition to transcend self-centeredness. I tell Guru Mahathi has to keep her in self-centeredness because she'll give away to all the stuff in the house. <laughs> <laughs> She's notorious. She'll give away all the popsicles, all of the ice cream. She'll just give it away to these children because there is something in her that cannot resist the act of giving. And it is something when you take your, your, your own children popsicles and give them to another child. You all can't do that. You can't do that. You can talk about it, romanticize about it, but you can't do it and you do not do it. There is no incidental record of you having acted in such a selfless manner. She does it on a daily basis. She is a good woman. And why does she do it? Because she feels somewhere deep in herself that all of these children and all of the people in the world are somehow connected to her. They don't belong to her. She understands that. But they belong to someone that she loves. Someone that she's in deep relationship with. And therefore she functions out of that relationship in the capacity of caretaker. The African mystics had a name for that kind of woman. They call her Kunsa. Kunsa means one who acts like she's the wife of God and takes care of this creature. Period. A Kunsa looks upon the whole creation as being her husband's children. All things in creation, her husband's things. And like any good wife, you take care of your husband's stuff. She has the spirit of a kunza. And as the coast, the consort and the wife of the God force, she becomes a huzuri the female counterpart of the Lord. A child, Radhaji, the wife of Swamiji Maharaj, the founder of the Radha Swami lineage, at the time of the transition of Swamiji Maharaj, his instruction to all of his disciples 
that you should look upon Radha Ji like you look upon my son. Because Radha Ji was his wife and his spiritual consort. She had authority over all that Swami Ji had authority. It's in some sense you see that the function of a Buddha. This is a Hasuri. And so I will call you the Kunsa Vasuri, the divine wife, the archetype, the stereotype, the incarnation, the avatar of the wife principle. And when you think about what it means to be a wife, think about Kunsa Vasuri and come to her. You, that's a lot. <laughs> And she will show you how to be a wife. She will demonstrate. The rest of these women you will meet will simply talk about the philosophy of being a wife. They cannot demonstrate it. Now just look into their relationships. Glance at it. Many of you have even tried being wives and you have failed and you have failed miserably because you didn't have the stuff that Kun Sa Fusari Ji is made of. And you need to humbly approach her and ask this person how to, to do this thing called life. Does not stand in his way does not interfere in his meditation, does not bring issues up to him that might disturb his mind to the point that he can't meditate, picks her time. Like any couple, there are grievances and conflict, but then she knows when to present them. She knows there's a sacred time. And even if there's something on my mind that I need to talk to Guru Murthy about, it might upset him, and I don't want his mind upset because he has to sit for his meditation. I know how to shut my mouth. You don't know how to do that. Behind every great mystic, there's a great female mystic. Get clear about it. In the tradition of Buddhism, they call her Dakini. They are the ones that take care of the great lamas. They make the way. Is that right, Kamalaj? A wife is an important thing. Would have earned you a fortune. I give you back your punsa Azurich. Take very good care. Relax. No more. Not enough to do. <laughs> I finish. Ten minutes if there's any questions you would like. And then we will break and end today's session. Or I will turn it back over to you for the doctor. <laughs> scripture or happiness. It has been a profound accomplishment. And it must be digested slowly. Because it is my summary argument. It is about happiness.
this is from this that we that we practice uh, focused on the third eye center. And I was wondering why did it you know they talk about the other spiritual uh, centers, uh, yeah. the other six. Yeah. I'm sure maybe some in here don't know about it. Perhaps I think maybe many, 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 many talks ago I must have said something about the chakra system and talk about that whole process. The reason I do not dwell on when it comes to discussing chakra talk and just simply begin with the Asma chakra is because Maharaj used to always say that this Agna chakra is where you are already at. He said, it's like if you want to climb a hill and you're already in the middle, you don't go back down to the bottom and start your journey over. In the same way, we are in this chakra. See, not fully in this chakra, of course, but we operate from here in the wakeful state of consciousness. All that the, Lord, the yogis do is drop their consciousness back down into these lower chakras and then bring it all the way back up. When you're sitting here, why do that? When you are sitting here, all of the other experiences that are available in the lower chakra are already integrated and subsumed in this level. I try, just like the physical organism contains cells, which are a lower structure, contains molecules, which is still a lower structure, contains the atoms. So you have atoms, molecules, cells. All of these lower and lesser stages are automatically subsumed. Hmm? in the higher state. In the same way, all of the experiences that are available to you in any of the lower chakras are already contained here. Coming here, you automatically access all that is available. So Maharaji said, why waste time? You see, simply access where you are at. The mystics have made it very simple for all of us. You see. They have considered all of and it has been their universal experience that the Ajna Chakra is the beginning of the spiritual journey. Even the yogis of the lower chakras confess as much. After all, they're starting at the lower chakras to give you. They just have not been shown the technique. That's why I say that we're so fortunate that we have come across this profound process. And the problem, of course, is like a, giving a child a diamond. When you are a child and you are childish, you will do with diamond what children do. You will throw, rock, throw it like it's a rock, play marbles with it. But it's really a great tool. In the same way you have been given now, initiation, into a very profound process, but in your spiritual immaturity, and childishness, you will use it like it's religion. You will use it like it's philosophy. You will not make right use of it. You cannot make right use of it. You don't have the maturity to make right use of it. But one day will come when you will grow up. And the, the, you will still know this way that I have offered you. And then you will truly be able to but as you are now, you have no concept, absolutely no concept of what you have. So you are still looking for this and that. You think something is still missing. I understand it. We all go through that. So I'm not condemning it. I am simply confessing that this is ordinary. This is the way that it happens. So we think it's a particular posture we must yet discover. It's the speed of the mantra, right? Or there's another book I must read, or a little bit more. Un you need to understand nothing else. There is nothing else to understand except understanding what you've got. Nothing needs to be added to the method. The method stands complete.